David Allen Goodrow was a social worker that became one of the most unsuspecting murderers in United States history. He managed to kill two young women in a rural community in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan during the years of 1991 and 1992. He committed these crimes in a small town that has a police department with very limited resources. One former classmate that graduated from high school with Goodrow has said that out of all the people in her graduating class, David Goodrow would have probably been the one classmate least suspected of ever committing a murder. When you have a murderer that looks like everybody else, those are the people that you are less likely to suspect, but they are also the cases that are the most difficult to solve. Society pretty much expects murderers to look like murderers, but as we all know, they don't. And as this episode will teach you, murderers come in all forms, from all places, and from all backgrounds. This is the case of David Goodrow. Hey guys, welcome to another episode, episode 30 fucking five. Can you believe it? Oh my gosh. I mean, I knew I would get here, but like when you're first starting off a podcast, like back in February, you know, my first episode, I think was the last Sunday of February. Um, when you're at, you know, single digits, first episode, second episode, so on and so forth, you know, you visualize yourself getting to triple digits and you visual your, visualize yourself, you know, being successful and being consistent. And um, I'm happy to say I've never missed a week. Um, I might have had to throw a Patreon episode in as um, my regular episode, but I've never missed a Sunday. <clears throat> and I do not plan on ever missing a Sunday unless I decide to take a little vacation and it's a it's a planned missed Sunday, you know what I mean? Which will probably come up um, maybe around the holidays. I'm thinking around Christmas. I might take off um, from Christmas till the end of January. Um, but if I have all my shit together, which I hope I do, I will probably pre-record a bunch of episodes and still, you know, give those to you. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there will come a time when I just need a brain break and, um, you know, I'm sure you guys can all understand, um, everybody needs a break at some point. So, um, this episode, I'm super excited to bring to you and let me tell you why. This is an episode about a murderer that murdered two people from my hometown or my area. So, it's, um, super crazy. Like, I remember when all this was happening um, I've been planning on doing this case for a while. There isn't a lot of um, information out there other than some old um, newspaper articles from the Daily Mining Gazette, which is the Houghton, Michigan newspaper. Um, but yeah, I am originally from a teeny tiny town. And when I say teeny tiny people, I mean teeny tiny. From my high school, my graduating class, we had 18 people. There were 14 girls and four boys. And I am not lying. I'm not yanking your chain. I am totally serious. Um, these murders, one occurred, the first one I'm going to be telling you about, that murder occurred in a nearby town where my mom and dad went to high school. They were high school sweethearts. Um, my mom ended up getting pregnant her senior year of high school with me and they got married right before they graduated from high school and I was born about six weeks after their high school graduation. So the first murder occurs in their hometown, 
which is about 30 minutes, a 30 minute drive from my hometown. The second murder that I'm gonna tell you about happened in a town about 10 minutes from where I went to high school. But at the time that it occurred, I only lived about six blocks away from the murder scene, which is super crazy. I'm gonna give you more information on how like closely related I was to this incident um, as I'm telling you guys the story. But I've been planning to do this one for a while. I just had so many other ones in my queue that I never really got to sit down and you know go through all the information and put some thorough notes together. So just know, I mean, I'm sure you already saw that this is a little bit shorter of an episode and it's just because there's just not as much information, um, but it's not a great story because of course we're talking about two young women that got murdered, but it's a great story because I know there's not any other podcasts out there except for two that I could find and they were both super short as well and both of those podcasters don't live in that area so you know they may have lived in the state of Michigan but they don't know the area the way I know the area and some of the people involved so I'm excited to bring this to you we're going to be talking about this fucking douchebag david goodrow obviously all murderers are douchebags um you know that goes without saying right but let's just get into it david allen goodrow was born on november 19th of 1955 he never drank and he never smoked he was happily married raised two delightful children and he faithfully attended church with his family He had a job that enabled him to help others, and he had friendly chats with his neighbors. But David Allen Goodrow had everybody in his community fooled. He was a killer. He would secretly kill and then kill again. Kathy Nankervis and Jody Watts were both victims of the mild-mannered and unassuming David Goodrow. He hardly looked or acted like a serial rapist or killer. A spiritual man, Goodrow, and his wife attended the Calvary Baptist Church, and he played softball on the church softball league. He was a federal employee working for the Social Security Administration. He had been employed by the state since 1978 and he was one of two field workers in the Houghton County office. In the year 1973, Goodrow graduated from Houghton High School, where he was an honor student and he excelled in basketball and golf. After that, he attended Michigan Technological University, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in forestry. I heard another podcast that I listened to um, say something to the effect that they thought it was a strange degree to go into, but hello, it's the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. There's woods everywhere. There's forests everywhere. I got the feeling that the podcast host, you know, knew nothing about the area, but anyways there's fucking forests everywhere so it seemed like a pretty good degree to go into if you ask me if you're from that area but anyways shortly after graduating from michigan tech goodrow got married and he left the area from there he held jobs in aurora illinois and in downstate michigan before returning again to the upper peninsula Goodrow had a dark side that he had successfully hidden for years. He had managed to bury his demonic nature, but eventually his sinister side did emerge. Kathy Nankervis stood at five feet, two inches tall, and she weighed just 115 pounds. She was a social security recipient and she was the mother of two children, and of course she was a client of David Goodrow's. Friends later reported that Nankervis was recently depressed, that she had two children and very little social life. I also wanted to mention that she had cerebral palsy and that resulted in a slurred speech 
and an awkward gait. Goodrow abducted Nankervis from her home in Launce, Michigan on June 12th of 1991 after peeking through her window and seeing her asleep fully naked on her couch. He quietly entered her house and bound her with duct tape. He had attempted to have sex with her, but as we hear in many other cases like this, he was not able to perform. Goodrow then took Nankervis to the lily pond area of the Portage Canal. Goodrow drowned her in that lily pond, but her body resurfaced. He then took her body out of the water and he repeatedly stabbed her. And I guess he assumed that a release of air from her body would allow her to sink. He did not, however, puncture her stomach. And thankfully, he didn't. Because the gases that were contained in her stomach later raised her corpse to the surface of the water. On June 15th, there only appeared a brief newspaper article about Nankervis being missing. And it said something to the effect that the police suspected foul play in Nankervis's disappearance, but they didn't have any clues to what had happened. Two weeks later, on June 25th, a fisherman discovered her body floating in the Portage Canal. The canal is a waterway that cuts through the Keweenaw Pen Peninsula with both entry and exit on Lake Superior. By this time, her decaying body had been floating in the waterway for 15 days. The U.S. Coast Guard recovered her body after a tip from that local fisherman. When Nankervis had initially been reported missing by her family, Authorities were not sure if they had a missing person case, a homicide, or a suicide. The discovery of her body, however, made it quite clear to the police on what they really did have on their hands. But the fact of the matter is, this police department hadn't seen a murder case in literal decades and probably wouldn't have known what to do with the evidence if it had bitten them in the fucking ass. In the Upper Peninsula, at least during that time, policing consisted of mainly breaking up bar fights and getting everybody home in one piece. And as far as the Catherine Nankervis case went, she was seen as an obscure 20-year-old small-town mother of two illegitimate children. And sadly, the popular assumption was that she was a quote-unquote slut and all. Um, so she had probably just hooked up with a long-gone traveling salesman and had ended up, you know, coming to a bad ending. Something bad had happened to her. You know, kind of like victim-blaming, basically. And it's too bad, but, you know, they figured that's how it goes when you're easy. The public as a whole and I remember this, didn't seem to really care about Nankervis. I mean, there was a lot of talk about it at that time, but it seemed more like gossip than them really wanting to find out what had actually happened to this young mother. It wasn't long at all before this case went cold. On January 21st of 1992, only seven months after the Nankervis murder, Goodrow struck again. Jody Watts was an attractive and popular co-ed on the Michigan Tech campus. The former high school track star was studying biology at the university, and her father was an administrator there. While jogging during the late night hours on that very cold winter evening, Goodrow grabbed Watts near the Houghton Municipal parking garage, which was adjacent to the Subway restaurant on Sheldon Avenue. He hauled Jody further into the parking garage where he raped her and stabbed her repeatedly. Goodrow suspected that she had probably recognized him, so he knew that he would have to kill her to avoid being caught. And Goodrow, if nothing else, 
had some real fucking audacity, guys. He was just a fucking asshole because he murdered Jody Watts within 100 fucking feet of the police station. Yes, you heard me. 100 feet away from the police station. Isn't that crazy? Jody Watts, bleeding profusely and near death, managed to crawl through the snow a total of 160 feet until she got to the nearby street. That's when a passerby on a bike discovered her, which was weird because it must have been a college student because nobody rides bikes in the winter, really, unless it's a college student. (laughs) Like, people have snowmobiles, people have, like, trucks, four-wheel drives, but... I think it's weird enough that Jody Watts was running in the middle of winter, but it's even stranger that somebody was literally riding their bike because if you've if you've ever been to the Upper Peninsula during January, there is so much snow. Like they don't get inches of snow like other parts of the country. You'll go to bed at night and you wake up to feet and feet of snow. It's crazy. But anyways, that biker covered up Jody's partially clad body with his jacket. And then, of course, he reported the incident to the police. And when the police arrived, I'm sure it didn't take long because, duh, they were right fucking there, 100 feet, 100 feet away. Um, Jody was still alive. But sadly, she died shortly after being transferred to Portage View Hospital. Reward money was quickly offered in the amount of $10,000 for anyone who had information that would lead them to Jody's murderer. So, I'm sure all of you can imagine how many phone calls came flooding into the police department after that. Incomes are primarily low in that area of the country, so... I mean, $10,000 is $10,000, but it's really not that much money. But there, that $10,000 was a very large sum of money to most. And I hadn't mentioned this part to you guys yet, but when this happened, I was a young mother with a baby. I had had my first daughter, and my husband at the time was the general manager at that Subway restaurant. Isn't that fucking crazy? He worked late nights and he even parked in that same parking garage where Jody Watts had been raped and murdered. There had been numerous calls from people reporting that my ex-husband was a possible suspect. Like literally, people were calling and saying, what about that guy that manages the subway? You know, blah, blah, blah. People in the community even claimed to have seen my my ex-husband's light blue Volkswagen hatchback vehicle near the scene of the murder. So, I mean, it, it was just so crazy. And I remember when this hit the news the next morning, my mom was frantic, guys, because... I always walked my daughter in her stroller because I, like I said, we only lived like six blocks away from the restaurant. So I would walk my daughter in her stroller down to the restaurant to like hang out, visit, say hi to my husband, get some free food (laughs) because I like free food. I love me some Subway, but um, yeah, so I would be there often and I didn't really go there. I mean, I would have never been there late at night, but my mom, of course, right away freaked out because she was afraid that I was the one that got murdered because Jody Watts was only a couple years younger than I was. And I really wasn't, you know, much of a runner, but, you know, she could have been thinking that, you know, maybe I just wanted to get out of the house because I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. And maybe that was my me time and me working out or whatever. But my mom did freak out. So this was the second murder in this community within a seven-month period. And of course, it sent shockwaves through the entire area. Women began locking their doors, which, duh, they should have been doing that before. But this was something that hadn't always been done before the Watts and the Nankervis murders. And I can attest to that because none of us ever locked our doors until those murders happened. I mean, I even remember being a latchkey kid 
and me and my sister would come home because my mom worked full time. She was a delivery driver for UPS and we would come home all the time to an empty house and the doors were never locked. It's not like we we were latchkey, but we didn't have keys to unlock the door, if that makes sense. But I mean, it's just fucking crazy, you know, what the world was like then. So Michigan Tech took quick action, though, in the wake of Jody Watts's slaying. Reluctantly, the university president authorized campus police to carry firearms, firearms because they didn't before, um, feeling it was imperative in order to provide some extra security on the college campus. The community now was on high alert. Grief and shock emanated from the Houghton area with the slaying of Jody Watts, a type of grief and shock that didn't really seem to d- be displayed at all when Kathy Nankervis's body had been discovered. And there wasn't any evidence that the second murder was linked to the first murder either. The single small town mother whose body had been pulled from the Portage Canal just seven months earlier was already gone and forgotten. With very few clues to go on, both of these murders went unsolved for much longer than police chief Raffelli and everyone else in the police department would have liked. And as a result, the FBI was enlisted to assist in solving this double homicide. One FBI profiler felt that the two murders might be related only because it would be highly unlikely that there would be two murderers killing at the same time in such a sparsely populated area. In addition, that profiler said that the perpetrator was probably physically strong, he probably hated women, and was most likely a local resident. Investigators ended up chasing down 500 leads over a 30-state area, but they still came up with absolutely nothing. In spite of the widespread attention and the vastly greater state and federal resources that were put to the case, the murder of Jody Watts ended up going cold as well. It wasn't until June 24th of 1993 when a Hancock woman reported a break-in at her apartment at 2.30 a.m. And just a little FYI, Hancock is the town that my mom and my youngest daughter live in now. It's another small town and it's across the Portage Canal where Jody Watts was murdered in the, at that parking garage by the Subway restaurant. So Houghton and Hancock, the two communities, are tied together by this really beautiful lift bridge. It's called the Portage Lift Bridge. So if you guys love bridges, if you guys love, you know, that type of stuff, um, go ahead and look that up. It's super cool. I love when I go visit that area. I love running across the bridge. Um, if you check out my personal Instagram from, you know, the times that I've been there to visit, I post tons and tons of pictures of that bridge. I'm kind of addicted to that bridge. But anyways, good row. He was captured walking near the police station on Quincy Street. So again, he's he's near a police station last time he was near the houghton police station and this time he's near the hancock police station so after attempting to break into the apartment of that young woman he's brazenly just walking past the fucking police station it's so weird and crazy and when goodrow was arrested he was carrying knives a tire iron a ski mask rubber gloves duct tape lubricating jelly and a video camera lieutenant randy myra said that he was about to go on vacation when he got a call to come into the station and interview goodrow he said they called me and said we got this guy who was walking through a parking lot and he has latex latex gloves on and a video camera and to be honest with you You know, the police officer said, I thought he was just some other pervert that was running around the area. Mayra said that he knew about Goodrow because um, he knew that Goodrow worked in the Hancock Social Security office and he was also a regular on a local radio talk show. 
He said, I used to listen to him and I thought, boy, that's a smart guy. Mayra said, eventually, Goodrow admitted to him that he was trying to break into the young woman's apartment in Hancock with the intent of assaulting her. However, although he had suspicions Goodrow might be involved with the Watts case, Mayra said he didn't know enough about it to question him about it. He was sure that someone from the Houghton Police Department was going to want to talk to him, and Goodrow admitted to the Houghton Police that he was the one that killed both Jody Watts and Kathy Nankervis. Goodrow's wife and children were all away at a Bible study camp at the end, or at the time of the attempted break-in. Let's can you imagine like being married? I mean, maybe many of you are married. I'm not married, but imagine being married and you go off to like a Bible study camp with your kids. You'd never think that your motherfucking husband would be like raping and murdering people. You know, I mean, that had to have been crazy. Um, one of Goodrow's co-workers by the name of James Lassala, he was another social security worker, another social worker, and he worked in that office. So it was the two, only two guys who worked in that social security administrative office. They lived only about a mile away from each other as well. Their children frequently played together, and the two men even carpooled to work quite often. Lassila could not believe it when he first heard that Goodrow had been arrested for murder. He stated that nobody ever saw it coming because Goodrow was so religious and whenever they were together, he always acted and spoke like a perfect gentleman. He never seemed at all like a violent person that would rape people or, or murder people. Goodrow's wife spoke with initial skepticism when her husband was arrested. Goodrow apparently excelled at keeping his hideous nature well hidden, even from his wife. For his defense, Goodrow hired defense attorney Mark Whiskey. Whiskey, whiskey. <laughs> I must want some whiskey. <laughs> Did I say whiskey? It seems like I said whiskey. I'm not going to edit it. Did I happen to mention that this is a unscripted and unedited um, podcast? <laughs> I mean, I do notes to keep me um, to keep me straight, <laughs> but I pipe in with all these things that pop into my brain, and I never edit out anything. Um, the, the couple times that I tried, I fucked it up royally, so I don't even bother. But if I said whiskey. I meant Wistie. <laughs> so his attorney's name was Mark Wistie. Since Goodrow had already confessed to these murders, Wistie was obviously quite limited in his options in defense strategies. An insanity defense seemed to be the most plausible choice, but insanity is incredibly difficult to prove even under the best of conditions. Few lawyers advocate using a mental illness argument since it is really rarely successful and extensive psychiatric exams are necessary. Goodrow's initial exam by the state didn't help with his position and he was declared competent to stand trial. The defense had a second psychiatric examination done by a Marquette psychologist. Marquette is another community that's located approximately 100 miles from where the murders took place. This exam refuted the initial findings, so a third exam had to be conducted. It was like the tie-breaking exam. This one confirmed Goodrow's sanity. The prosecutor said that they had what he coined a beautiful confession there was no chance at all of any acquittal. Goodrow pleaded guilty and had a bench trial. And for those of you who do not know, a bench trial does not have a jury and the judge makes the ruling of guilt or innocence and also determines the sentence if the defendant is found guilty at trial. During this trial, Goodrow serenely described the murders of both Nankervis and Watts. He was relaxed and seemed indifferent. At the very end of the trial, 
the judge asked Goodrow if he had reflected at all on the charges. And Goodrow said, quote, I've reflected on it for some time, Your Honor, in the word of God and in prayer. I felt I was influenced by satanic forces at the time of the crimes. Goodrow was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. He is serving his time at the Saginaw Correctional Facility in Saginaw, Michigan, and I can pretty much imagine that he has plenty of time to pray these days. So, that's the story of fucking fuckface David Goodrow. I do want to mention that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. So one of his children, um, his son is named Brett David Goodrow. He is a registered sex offender in the state of Michigan. He's another piece of shit, obviously. Um, He was convicted on May 24th of 2003 of criminal sexual conduct in the fourth degree. And I don't know any more information on that, um, but I do know that his son is a piece of shit too. So um, I can imagine that it was probably not easy for Brett or his, you know, other sibling to grow up, you know, after his dad had been arrested for murder, rape and murder, I guess I should say. Um, But that's no fucking excuse to be a piece of shit so yeah um isn't it crazy though like that this happened in my small town um there's been some other things that I'm finding out now too that like last night I'm gonna tell you guys this I was watching the new Dahmer Netflix special And I think I was on um, episode three or four. I was binging it. I'm still not done. But, you know, we all know the story of Jeffrey Dahmer. I love the actor that's playing Dahmer. So I was more excited about seeing how that actor plays the, the role than actually watching, you know, the story about Jeffrey Dahmer. But um, I'm watching it and I posted in my Instagram and Facebook stories that I was watching it. And one of my friends from high school, you know, we keep in touch. She messaged me and I never knew this at all at the time. But her second cousin was um, Jeffrey Dahmer's first victim. And I guess that he went missing in 1989. His name was Steven. And as soon as she told me this, that part in the Netflix series came on, like the actor who was playing her cousin. So it was just crazy to me. I never knew this. I don't know how I did not know this, but he went missing in 89. So this was only a year after we graduated. And Dahmer was, um, he, he was caught in 91. So they knew what had happened to Stephen in 1991. So for three years, they knew nothing. And I never knew this. I never knew this until my friend mentioned it to me. And I, I just feel so, so terribly bad, you know. Um, but he was from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan originally as well. He was from an area called Ontonagon. That's the town's name. And I actually have another friend that lives there that we keep in touch to. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's just so bizarre, you know, the things that happen, even in a small town. You can't assume that because you live in a small area that, you know, you cannot be raped. You cannot be murdered because, of course, you can. So, and honestly, guys, this... This conversation with my high school friend also made me just really, I mean, not that I didn't know this already, but it really like hit it home that everybody we talk to 
when all of us true crime podcasters are telling these stories or for listeners like I listen to many podcasts many true crime podcasts you know I love listening to it I love thinking about like the you know the psychology of it all I love you know about the police work the investigation all these things forensics it's it's so interesting to me but there's these are actual people and sometimes it's it's easy to forget that it's actual people we're talking about it's actual people who went through these actual incidents that either really injured them or took their lives and it just i hope I hope that if there's any other true crime podcasters out there that are listening to this episode, I really hope that they take what they're doing to heart and I hope that they use integrity. I hope that they always, you know, remember that, you know, people actually died and there's survivors out there. There's family members out there that could potentially listen. I know I've said this before too because, you know, I had in the past so in the recent past i've had a um family member reach out to me after you know they came across one of my podcast episodes on youtube and although i already knew that you know there's survivors out there and everything you don't fully understand it until somebody reaches out to you so yeah, I just hope that everybody continues to portray these cases and talk about these cases in their podcast episodes with the highest amount of integrity and, you know, class. So, I mean, I hear some podcasts, there's some podcasts that I've listened to, you know, where everybody's like laughing and cracking jokes. And those are the podcasts I turn off immediately. Like, it's, I don't know, I just find it um, very disrespectful. And yes, you know, you can tell jokes, you can be silly, you can be funny. But some of these podcasters will actually, you know, make jokes about the victims or where they were or what was happening or whatever. And it's just very distasteful. And I can't listen to anything like that. So, So if you all could just say a prayer for both the Nankervis family as well as the Watts family. I'm sure that there's not a day that goes by that they don't think about their loved ones that were murdered by David Goodrow. And um, I mean, I, I can't imagine how they could ever forget about it. So I hope that, you know, they're finding happiness in life. I hope that they've been able to move on, find success. I do remember reading. I didn't put this in my show notes or anything, but I do remember reading about um, Kathy Nankervis's mother. I think that she filed a lawsuit and um, she didn't win. I can't remember exactly what the lawsuit was about. But um, it was something against the state, you know, since David Goodrow was, you know, an employee of the state through the Social Security Administration. So I think that she filed some kind of lawsuit through, you know, through that. But, you know, she did not win, um, unfortunately. So but it really, really was sad that Kathy Nankervis didn't get hardly any attention compared to Jody Watts. And, and I know it's because Nankervis, you know, had a disability. She had cerebral palsy and Jody Watts was a beautiful college co-ed. She was, you know, in sports, she was running off. She was a runner. Um, so it, and it just looking back, it's just kind of, it really makes me sick. It doesn't kind of make me sick. It really makes me sick that people put more emphasis on one person's death over the other person's death because, you know, both lives were equally important. And I don't know how Kathy Nankervis's 
kids are doing, but she did leave behind two children and I hope they're doing awesome. You know, I hope they they're living the best life and I hope they're able to, you know, make their mother proud. So, oh, it's just these things get to me. Um, thank you to those of you who have requested this case because I know my cousin Jen follows me on Instagram. So she mentioned this case to me in Messenger, like in the DMs one day. And I was like, oh, yeah, like I've been totally planning on doing that case. I've just kind of been procrastinating about putting it together. So thank you, Jen, if you're listening, um, for reminding me about it and kind of pushing me to do it. I guess I, I guess I didn't do it because it was a shorter case. And, you know, normally I'm doing longer cases, but um, I still think it's an important case. It's important to get it out there. It's important to, you know, talk about every case, not just the well-known cases. So, uh, yeah. So, and then thanks to those of you who have also been responding on my recent reel. I, I love doing reels. So I did this reel and I asked people what I should cover next. And there were some great answers. So I'm going to start deep diving into you know some of the recommendations i think you're awesome um there was one recommendation that i will not do i will not cover and that is the case of little baby jackson burnett i cannot cover that case he died when he was only um i think he was like six weeks old and his entire life was just all abuse And his parents are both in prison, but there's not any way that I would be able to get through that story without bawling. I mean, somebody recommended it to me. I happened to see the message or happened to see the notification in my Instagram, like in the middle of the night, because I got up to pee and like I couldn't fall back asleep. So I picked up my phone and just started scrolling. Do you guys do that too? I hate doing it, but I figured, hey, let me, you know, Maybe I'll get tired if I'm doing some reading or whatever. But I read that notification. I looked up the story and fuck, it haunted me. Like the pictures of this little baby. The baby was just bruised and the arm was broken. And I just, I was bawling. I was straight up bawling in my bed at 3.30 in the morning. And I could not get those images out of my brain because they're right there on the fucking internet and um it's it it's i don't even want to talk about it but i just want to let you know that whoever recommended it thank you for recommending it but i cannot do it i already knew that i would never be able to cover the baby um brianna case um, brianna lopez i can never cover anything about infants um, I just can't. So um, it is devastating to me. Ugh, I feel sick just talking about it now. And now I'm probably going to be thinking about it for like the next whole day. But anyways, guys, I appreciate you guys hanging in here with me. I hope you love this case. I hope you learn something um, about a new area of the United States. It's a beautiful area up there. So if you do ever get an opportunity to go up there, I would recommend going in the summer or the fall, the leaves, the leaf changing. Oh my gosh, it is gorgeous. And you'd probably want to avoid it in the winter unless you love feet and feet of snow and you want to go skiing, you want to go snowshoeing, you want to go ice fishing, and you want to go snowmobiling. (laughs) I avoid going up to visit in the winter whenever possible because I am a Florida girl now and I don't do well with the super cold weather. But anyways, guys, I love you all. If you could be so kind as to head on over and leave me five stars on whatever platform you're listening to this at. If you haven't done that already, please do because it really, really helps me grow. And if you're listening on Apple, go ahead and leave me a review. And in that review, maybe tell me um, what your favorite case has been so far. I would love to hear it. If you've done those things already, meet me over at Instagram, slide into my DMs. 
I would love to learn more about you. I'm already um, almost to 500 followers. I know that doesn't seem like that many, but I don't really spend that much time trying to grow my Instagram. I probably should, but I've got so many other things going on right now. I work full time. I'm starting this other awesome business that I think is going to be very lucrative. It might enable me to um, have more time freedom so that I can actually pump out extra episodes here and there, which I'm super excited about because I really, really enjoy bringing you these, um, these stories and these episodes. So anyways, guys, I love you. Like I already said, 5,000 times. (laughs) And until next week, next Sunday, keep talking crime.